Hello, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Tino Perez here at the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College and this is episode 15 of Arguing the OE and the title for today's episode is Thinking and the Soldier and specifically what I want to talk today about is abductive reasoning and explain what that is and then try to argue that if we do abductive reason, mind, reasoning mindfully, if we pay attention to it and we do it deliberately, that it can pay benefits uh, to the soldier. So one of the things we do uh, uh, when we deploy someplace or we're trying to conduct operations in, in an area of operations is we want to gather as many perspectives uh, about the situation we're dealing with as possible. So normally we'll seek out uh, members of uh, uh, key leaders, politicians or government, uh, government uh, officials. We'll seek out members of the civil society, members of NGOs who work in that region. We'll seek out members of the indigenous population, as well as other military professionals who have served there before. And this helps us fill out a picture about what is going on and what are some ways we might intervene in order to get things better. But one of the things we want to do with abductive reasoning is to consult scholarly academic theories. Because there are many civilian uh, academics writing about our business yet we really don't have much awareness of what they're writing about or what they're, what they're finding out. So these scholars are writing about uh, interstate war, they're writing about ethnic conflict, they're writing about civil wars, they're uh, writing about strategy, but we as military professionals are not in the habit of consulting the literature, mostly because it's written uh, within the social sciences, uh, uh, social science, scientific disciplines, and especially for political science. We're very comfortable with history, we're not so comfortable uh, with political science and social science. And so that's why I want to talk about abductive reasoning today. How might it be helpful? We go to an AO, there's fighting going on, there's violence, and we are charged with reducing that violence and moving things towards uh, conflict termination in accordance with our Army doctrine. One of the things we could do is consult different theories about why fighting is going on uh, in civil wars, in insurgencies, in, st in stability operations, etc. Another thing we could do is, if we are regionally aligned with another part of the world, we could bring our units up to speed by exposing them to scholarly theories about what's going on, say, in sub-Saharan Africa, or in various parts of Asia, or in various parts of uh, uh, South America or Central America, in order to give them a better understanding of the dynamics. And that's what abductive reasoning, I think, is going to do for us. Now first, let me describe uh, two other types of reasoning that are commonly uh, uh, taught here in the college, but I would argue we don't really do in our profession that much. Okay. One of them is deductive reasoning. In deductive reasoning, what we do is we have a theory, a scientific theory, And we want to test that theory. And the way we do it is we draw hypotheses from that theory, and we apply it and test it with various cases. So there's case one. We test it with case two, and so on. And we keep on testing the hypotheses in order to either prove that this theory is, is, is uh, robust or we're trying to uh, prove that the theory is not true and that it's indeed we're trying to falsify the theory. But in all cases when we're doing deductive reasoning what we're concerned about is the theory and whether it's good or whether it's bad. We're not scientists. We don't really do this. There are very few cases in which we are concerned about a theory and not as concerned about the specific cases that are out there. Let me describe another type of reasoning. This is called inductive reasoning. And it actually works the other way. In inductive reasoning, we are looking at different cases. And what we're trying to do is draw certain commonalities or stylized facts that hold true for each of these cases. And then what we do is we put all those stylized facts together and we posit a theory. 
that we hope holds true for these cases, but then in applying deductive reasoning later, holds true for other cases as well. Once again, in inductive reasoning, what we're trying to do is create a theory. A scientist does this. If we're concerned with a theory first and foremost, we're not so concerned with the cases. These are just examples to draw from in order to create our theory. We don't do this. So what do we do? We do, I argue, abductive reasoning. And what we have, then, in our situation as military professionals, as soldiers, is we have an event or a problem. In this case, we'll call it an area of operations. And there are things going on there that we need to come to grips with. We need to stri strive to understand. And in this situation, there are governmental factors mixing with economic factors, with mixing with civil society, with uh, different forms of identity, ethnicity, religiosity, and as well as armed groups, lethal violence operating here. But we need to come to grips with why there's violence happening and why there's instability. So what we have is a military professional seeking an explanation. And the idea is that if we understand our area of operations, we can then intervene with our troops, with our money, with our speech, and with our relationships in order to move things, to nudge things towards a better state of affairs. And this is what we end up doing. We're not concerned with a theory, either via deductive reasoning or inductive reasoning. What we're concerned with, first and foremost, is figuring out what's going on in this specific case. So this happens all the time. We deploy someplace, or we are regionally aligned someplace, and we try to use our intuition in order to find out what's going on. The problem is that there are counterintuitive things going on. They go against our intuition. They're counterintuitive. There are anomalous things that are going on. There are hidden dynamics that are going on. And oftentimes, common sense and intuition are not sufficient to crack open this area of operations in order to understand what's going on and therefore to intervene successfully. So what we end up doing is using our intuition. But with abductive reasoning and doing it, doing it mindfully, what we try to do is draw upon established theories. So here's theory one, here's theory two, uh, here's theory three, and we keep on going. What we try to do then is become knowledgeable of different theories that would help explain what's going on in our area of operations. This works in different ways. What these theories do for us, what a theory does for us, oftentimes it explains things causally. It'll have a bundle of x-y relationships in terms of uh, a causal uh, idea about what causes what x causes y, uh, for example. Oftentimes, these will be complementary. Uh, my, uh, my class, uh, the Local Dynamics of War Seminar, uh, just got done with an exercise, exercise last week where they were looking at the uh, favelas and the uh, narco problem and the Army's involvement in, the, uh, in, in Rio de Janeiro in the favelas uh, during the uh, late 90s and then uh, 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 during the 2000s. And what they were doing in order to help them understand the situation is they were looking at different uh, uh, scholarly articles. Some of these talked about, say, uh, the role of civic organizations and NGOs in the favelas and the role they played. Other theories looked at the nexus, the connection between these civic organizations, the narco uh, drug gangs, and politicians in the favelas. Others looked at cooperation. Uh, between the police and the narco traffickers within the favelas in something called spectacle raids. Other theories looked at the role of democratization and the relationship between increasing and decreasing levels of democratization and human rights uh, uh, respect in the favelas. And then uh, uh, other, other theories looked at youth culture and different aspects of it, for example, the music and, and the types of parties that, that they had in, in the favelas. 
And then other uh, theories look at the relationship between crime, the police, and the court system. So in this case, what you have is a bunch of theories making causal claims that are complementary, and that the more theories we, we consult and learn and brief to each other, the richer a picture we're able to draw of what's going on in the, in, about the area of operations. Another example, though, is where they, these theories are actually contradictory, and that can also be useful to us. So suppose we deploy to, a, to, a, to an area of operations, and an S3 is briefing his commander that, hey, sir, uh, the reason there's fighting going on here is because there are grievances. The people have grievances, and that's why we see violence. But that's shortchanging the commander, because there are other theories about why civil wars occur than simply grievances. There are also theories of greed. And if some folks aren't fighting simply because the, the, the state's not fulfilling their desires or they're being oppressed. Some of them are doing it because they're tied to criminal organizations or they're simply trying to get more money within this area of operations. Other folks, other theories, look at opportunity. Right? So we see grievances everywhere around the world. We see greed everywhere around the world, but we don't always see civil war. So something has to describe why it arises here, not there. And so there's other theories that say, well, it's actually opportunity. So uh, is there a uh, terrain where, and, where uh, a rebellion can hide out, plan operations, conduct operations, and come back, and come back to uh, and refit. Well, if you're in an ar archipelago or in your mountainous terrain, the uh, theories show that you're more likely to have rebellions. So there's a whole other set of theories here. And then you have another uh, set of theories that talk about cleavages. Right? And this says, well, this uh, posits that there is fighting going on in an area of operation for two reasons. One, there's a cleavage, a master cleavage in the area of operations between North and South, or Sunni versus Shia, or Christian versus uh, 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 Muslim, or, or East versus West. It doesn't matter. That's a master cleavage. But then what happens is, in various parts of a country, there'll be fighting going on, but these th these fights, this fighting is occurring for private reasons that go back for decades. And what happens is, according to a statement of Kali Vas, who talks about this theory, is that there is cooperation between these local private fights and those persons who are controlling the master cleavage fight at the national level. So here's another complicating theory. If you only go in to a civil war thinking, hey, everything's about grievances, you're shortchanging your commander and you're shortchanging the, the soldiers in the effort. There's much more going on. But the only way we get at it is by consulting uh, mature academic scholarly theories in order to inform and complicate our thinking. Okay. Thank you very much. See you next week.